Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Dredgeback Cutter Suction System webinar. My name is Brittany Hines, Marketing Specialist here at HIPAC, and I will be your host for today's presentation. Before we begin, I just want to remind you about the question box on the side of your screen. We will be taking questions at the end of the webinar, so please submit them using the question drop-down box. Also, if you are unable to hear us or the screen goes blank, please comment in the chat box so we can fix the issue. So for today's webinar, we are going to demonstrate the basic configuration of a cutter suction dredge and dredge pack with all the necessary sensors and their respective device drivers. There will also be a focus on the most prevalent hardware variations. Our presenter for today is Rob Baird, who has spent 10 years in high pack tech support and is now in high pack technical sales. He brings great experience and expertise to our company, and we are so happy to have him here with us today to talk more about the cutter suction system. So with that, I'm going to turn over the presentation and Thank you so much, Brittany, and thank you everyone for joining us here today. This is dredge pack for cutter suction and auger dredges. Most specifically, we'll be looking at the hardware and the configurations necessary for us to use these sensors and get us to where we want to be in dredge pack as we're seeing the proper visualizations, getting the proper data displayed on the, on the screen, getting our operator to know exactly where the dredge template is using a cutter suction dredge in dredge pack. That's where we are today. Let's take first a look at some different cutter suction and auger dredges. They come in all shapes and sizes, and it doesn't matter. We really can work with any of these. It is the simplest installation for dredge pack, for high pack uh, in our dredge installations. Cutter suctions are much easier than say, excavators and cranes and hopper dredges. At its simplest, we're looking at a dual antenna GPS that goes on your dredge for positioning and heading, and one of two different types of depth sensors, either an angle sensor or a pressure sensor, but they could go on any of these types of dredges. I see uh, an Ellicott, I see a, a DSC dredge in there, and I believe an IHC dredge, uh, an IMS or um, liquid waste bottom right. You're looking at the type of auger dredge that would use our manual configuration in the inclinometer driver to get the depth out. But either way, no matter what type of cutter suction or auger dredge you have, regardless of the size, as long as you have just one ladder, well, we're gonna be fine. All we need is the GPS with two antennas and also a depth sensor. If we look at the physical installation of the sensors that you are going to need on your dredge, it could be done a number of different ways. But again, with the simplest of installations, top left, you're seeing two antennas. Looks like this is a Trimble system. They specify they should be two meters apart whatever it might be, give it at least six, seven feet for sure. And that way you'll have better heading as you are able to go out and give the proper heading for your dredge body, which is necessary. As you know, your dredge body is not moving very much at all. But over time, we need to show that movement. And of course, if, if you have your two antennas too close, it increases the error budget and your heading might be off that much more. So the farther apart, the better. At least two meters is what they say. Bottom left, you see a hemisphere that looks like one of their vector series. And although it looks like something of a T-wing, um, it actually is two antenna heads within that casing, that single casing. And in the middle bottom, that looks like an E-track sensor and inclinometer. And that appears to be on an auger dredge actually, although usually we see the pressure sensors on the auger dredges and we see the inclinometers on the traditional hydraulic car suction dredges. Uh, you can still put them on there. Uh, in, in certain cases. And at right, you're looking at a cab. I see a Trimble system at the top. It looks like a Trimble SPS 461 is the yellow receiver and all other things. The basic idea there is within your cab, just be comfortable, be safe, get everything tied out of your way. You don't want cables in the way. That's the worst thing that you could possibly have within your cab. The minimum equipment needed. Well, the minimum equipment is truly what I've said a couple times already, just a dual antenna GPS to give you position and heading and a depth sensor. So it could be an inclinometer, which measures the angle. 
and then we know the known length of ladder, and we're able to do that triangular math to get you to your depth. But also, uh, knowing that depth, knowing that angle, we could tell you the proper X, Y, and Z of your cutter head or, uh, or the center of your auger on your dredge, uh, just by having these various sensors. So uh, pitch and roll, optional. We talked uh, a little bit about the, the main sensors we need. Now let's go into these optional ones. Pitch and roll, you don't see it all that often on a cutter suction dredge. Sometimes if it's, a, if it's going to be pitching quite a bit, uh, like we saw the E-Track the e inclinometer on an auger dredge, well, if you're gonna choose to go that route, you might want some pitch roll because there is considerable pitch, especially forward and aft as you are going to um, move back and forth and there's a star wheel design or other varieties when you don't have spuds pushing you down and keeping you in place in the back of your dredge, you can have a lot of movement. So pitch and roll sensors, optional. Honestly, more than nine times out of 10, they are not on cutter suction dredges, but uh, they can be included just the same with draft sensors, which could be a pressure sensor or a transducer. Either way, it can measure the dynamic draft of your vessel. You could also alternately uh, put that dynamic, dynamic draft of your vessel into the vessel's menu in dredge pack. If you know what it is and you believe that it's you know, going to be uh, close to a single value and you're not going to have to uh, play around with it too much, you don't need a sensor for it, you could enter that in dredge pack too. The last one is, although optional, is getting to be less and less optional, especially in the States if you're working in navigable waters, RTK. It's almost inescapable that you are going to have on any Army Corps job, Coast Guard job, government job of almost any kind nowadays, written into the job specs, certain vertical accuracies that are necessary, and you absolutely have to be able to work with them. Well, <laughs> unfortunately, uh, it comes at a cost. RTK, or real-time kinematic water surface elevations, coming into your GPS. You could do it two ways. You could do it with N-trip corrections, and you get a service to allow you to log into a VRS correction stream online, so you have to pay for the internet, you have to have it at all times, steady, stable internet, to get your RTK corrections through your GPS. The other way to do it is the more localized approach, but more expensive on the front end, that's a base station. So if you want to take your base station, put it on a tripod, up on land, on a ground control point that's been surveyed out, and you know it's the proper vertical datum, you've got the X, Y, and Z for that particular spot, set up your tripod, connect to it, get the proper messages, RTCM or uh, CMR, CMRX, CMR plus, whatever it might be, the various messages you can use to communicate from your base station to your receiver on board, and you can get your water surface elevations that way. Another localized approach, not RTK, uh, is the use of a tide gauge. And we see tide gauges all the time. Um, one of the most popular ones is the E-Track tide gauge that we sell quite often, where you can set it up locally. Uh, if RTK is not necessary, and if you're going to have reasonable line of sight between your dredge and wherever you're able to set the stilling well for the pressure sensor, which is the tide gauge, setting it up off of a dock or a pier or something, you can set that up within a stilling well so it accurately represents the water surface elevation. And then you can make sure that you hone in nicely to that proper vertical datum. You get that zero. Whatever your vertical datum is that you need to reference for your job specs, you're going to localize it. You're going to put in the proper tide correction, and it will go into a um, it'll go into a, a small um, computer, which will then radio it across to your dredge, and then you'll get your your tide that way. So a number of different ways to do it. Tide probably being after position at the top and the depth sensor, we're seeing the tide corrections probably as the, the next most important piece and. Uh, in a few years, I think it'll be absolutely necessary to have RTK. Dual antenna, GPS systems. Again, the number one thing we need out of your cutter suction dredge. Number two is this, the inclinometer for depth of cutter head. But right back here real quickly, this is for your dredge body positioning and heading. We need the positioning, but that gets reduced down to a single point, which will be your boat reference point. That boat reference point is your trunnion. That's the point where your ladder attaches to the dredge body, and it will be left, right, the center of your trunnion. So 
You need to find that point, that's your zero, 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 or your boat reference point. If you create a boat shape in our boat shape editor in HiPack, you're going to reference that and everything will be X, Y relative to that. And that way we will be able to properly reference your, your vessel and put you on the map accurately. And then all the offsets need to be measured and input properly also in HiPack hardware. But the idea here is if you have the proper heading, you have the proper positioning, now we're going to move on to the next sensor, the next piece of the puzzle, which is getting your depth. What we offer is the E-Track inclinometer with an integrated US Digital A2T sensor. This is in the standard high pack cutter suction system, and we've had it for years. Now, of course, there are other sensors. There's many sensors integrated into the inclinometer DLL the inclinometer device driver in high pack hardware. You can go to the drop down option and select any number of sensors. But for ease of use, we have been selling these for years and they're ruggedized. You can see the picture at the right, how it's sitting on, on a, a bracket and it comes with a zinc anode. So if you're in a very uh, salt, uh, salt water area, it will prevent corrosion. At left, you see the subsea cables and the connectors in the bottom left you see the plastic interface box that will have the wiring with the terminals within it and it's out of that that a small printer cable over usb goes into your computer and that's how these angle sensors are integrated into your computer so it really reduces down to a usb and it's powered over a usb you don't even need to apply external power to this thing so if you have your own computer already and you have your systems on your dredge, that's great. You're taking all those things into consideration. You might be worried about buying this new system. What are the power concerns? Well, you're not getting any out of these E-Track sensors. They're powered over USB. The GPS, well, that's a different story. You could choose to power AC or DC, but we'll get to there You know, when we get there. Um, for now, the inclinometer comes in over USB, and uh, you will use SEI Explorer to be able to set that up. And um, anyway, that's the proprietary software that allows you to set it up before it comes in a high pack, make sure it's working, and then it comes in a high pack and it's on us. The alternate to inclinometers or angle sensors are pressure sensors. And now if you're looking to use this for your auger depth, well, it's a great option. You would probably weld this onto the ladder just, uh, just behind uh, the fish mouth. You're looking to... Um, have it at, at the base of suction most likely and what you're going to do is put it at a known depth why are we using this instead of an inclinometer well that's because the rear end of your auger dredge might go up and down it's uh it's a very dynamic situation and that's because of a variety of different mechanical designs that we've seen for auger dredges through the years and there's different manufacturers they all do it differently but most of the time they are not spudded down and they have a, either a star wheel or some other contraption to allow it for uh, perhaps some forward propulsion. And if not just that, at least it, it allows for positioning, right? Well, um, it just moves around. Top, uh, you know, fore and aft, it's just moving. You're pitching wildly sometimes. So uh, depending on what you're hitting, you'd really be better off using a pressure sensor because then you can get the known depth of that pressure sensor and equate it to whatever calibrated depth you need for your auger head. That's, that's a good way of doing it. Uh, and what you do is you're, you're going to get an analog to digital converter. This DGH-1251 converter is something that's sold by HiPack if you need it, along with a KPSI pressure sensor that will actually measure um, the, uh, the readings in milliamperage values. And then at right, you can see there's a, a min and a max and um, we have both raw milliamperage values. Those are what come out of the uh, WCOM terminal or any test terminal program when you're doing the calibration of one of these. Uh, you need to know if you hit dollar sign one capital R capital D, enter, it will read back a raw milliamperage uh, value. So yes, there's more work included. If you're using a pressure sensor, you could always contact us at uh, help at highpack.com. Our technical support team is excellent as far as everything is concerned and especially when it comes to these these dredging applications we can give you all sorts of uh help and um anyway so please do contact us if you have more questions about it or refer to our other youtube videos but the idea here is you enter in the raw milliamperage value you enter in 
the real depth that you know you're measuring it with a tape measure, you're measuring it with a rope, whatever, and you're having two calibrated depths within your range. So one at the top of the water column, one at the bottom, closer to the bottom of where you're actually digging. In this case, one to six and a half feet, the raw milliamperage values equal those real depths, and that's how we uh, arrange for that range scale of values. Next popular, I would say the next most popular, would be a swing sensor. So if you are not on a standard cutter suction, but instead a swinging ladder cutter suction dredge, you will actually have the dynamic heading of, of the ladder compared to the pontoon or the dredge body, right? So you need to have a rotation sensor. It needs to be placed right at the point of pivot. Or if not, as you can see this apparatus at left, this uh, little um, mechanism is so that you have a one-to-one -one ratio and, and you can guarantee that it's turning at the same ratio as that of your uh, turning uh, or that of your, your uh, pivot point rather. So um, that's on the end user to find a way to get it over the, the shaft, over the, the pivot point. That's the best way to do it. If not, you have to build something like this to make sure you're accurately reading that heading. And that way we can have the, um, the set or static position of your dredge body that's given to us from the GPS. And we can also have the rotation of your ladder. We could show those at the same time. We talked about tide gauges. Well, obviously RTK is so popular now more so than ever, but the tide gauges have been around and they're great in areas where you have bad RTK for whatever reason or it's just unavailable. If you don't have a BRS subscription, if you don't have good internet where you're going, you could set up this localized uh, contraption. It's great. It's a stilling well, usually in a PVC pipe with a whole bunch of holes drilled in it. You drop the pressure sensor in, you're in the water column, you put it down, four or so inches from the bottom of that shaft. You need to make sure that the PVC pipe is deep enough to allow for water um, for, for your full tide cycle. It has to go, you know, high tide, low tide. You always have to have water so that you can read that reading. And it's just like the pressure sensors for depth. In this case, you're going to be setting up a range scale and uh, uh, that's all done on its own. Really, all you have to do is enter the known tide uh, at that point, and you'd enter it right in the, at the bottom here, and you see that each track uh, tide gauge, and that tide track, you'd type in the tide, and that would get radioed across to the dredge, and it would say, okay, we've got 2.67 extra feet of water over at the dock. We're a couple hundred yards away. We're going to use that value as our tide, and that way it's the, the smartest, the most localized way to get your water surface elevation when you don't have access to RTK. And as usual, these come in mostly over serial connections or USB. And as much in years past, we didn't want you to have to use the USB, serial to USB converters. They've become a necessity. They've become, uh, you know, much more stable and much more secure and uh, quicker in the tr transmission of data. Um, and you can get good ones uh, relatively cheap nowadays. So um, we no longer say don't use them. We say just be careful when you're using them and research them as best you can. Manual tide gauges, these are mostly for QC checks. Hey, you can just put in a little bar out there, right? You say, hey, look, here's our tide gauge. Now, you might have one that you can, you know, latch onto, or you might just have a little uh, board you're putting out there. Either way, um, there's different ways to bring it in over hardware, or again, the manual uh, tides. You can do it by creating a tide file. There's so many different ways to do it, but people are using manual tide gauges quite a bit. Um, and again, just you need to know what vertical datum is being used in your job specs, what's being referenced. Is it mean sea level? Is it mean low or low water? What are we looking at? Set it up appropriately. Angle sensors for pitch and roll, those might look familiar. Those are the same e track um, A2T sensors within the ruggedized housing. You can see how they're set up at 90 degrees to each other. This looks like it's on the back of an excavator cab, but the idea here is that you are going to be able to measure. Uh, both the pitch and the roll, they're daisy chained together. They come in and they're uh, brought in and configured over SEI Explorer just the same way as the, as the rotation device is and also your ladder, your inclinometer. You need to know all of your accurate offsets horizontally. Again, we talked about the GPS. If you have a dual antenna GPS, you need to know which way you're facing. So, you know, your phone might help you nowadays. Um, you know, if people still have a compass out there or some other way, you know, uh, a gyro, whatever you got to, to figure out your proper heading, use the sun, 
and um, do a raw test. So turn on your, your GPS, show which way we are facing you in dredge pack without any manipulation, okay? If it's facing one way, you should be able to tell from the direction of your antennas on board, you should be able to tell, okay, well, this has us facing west, but we're actually facing due east, right? So you can look at that and say, well, based on that, um, what we have here is the front antenna, the number one antenna, usually on a, a Trimble system, at least, um, the one that plugs in uh, to the A or the one port on the back of the Trimble receiver, that one's your position antenna. And therefore, the second one is the heading antenna. It's giving us a unique position, but its math is such that it allows to compute a heading or a bearing um, for you by taking the second point and drawing a straight line right through the front of the first one. So it's just trial and error, figure out which way your GPS antennas have you facing. And then from there, you can choose to put in an angular offset if you need to. You could do that either in the proprietary software of the GPS or in uh, high pack under the device offsets. But once you do that and you have everything properly entered, then we can worry about our horizontal offsets. Again, GPS will be um, a forward and a starboard offset relative to your boat reference point. Starboard's positive, port is negative. Forward is, is positive, aft is negative. The GPS vertical offset, only necessary if you're using RTK tied. You can put it in there as a placeholder, and plenty of people do. They just don't want to forget what it is. They want to make sure it's always in there, and it's written into the Survey32 INI, which is the hardware configuration settings file unique to each and every dredge project within your HIPAC folder. So again, Survey32.INI is your hardware configuration settings file. It will hold all this stuff, all this data, everything that you have in your HIPAC hardware configuration will be saved there. Uh, so please do make sure that you measure accurately and you enter all these offsets into high pack hardware. Your inclinometer offsets, quite frankly, you don't really need to enter anything in. You can leave them at zero. Just put your GPS device offsets in. Speaking of RTK GPS, we have a system at left where you see two antennas top left on the back of what looks to be an auger dredge. And uh, there's a couple different options for getting your real time kinematic tide corrections through your GPS. That's that's what is the secret behind RTK. Well, one way is a VRS network with a rover using ntrip.dll or uh, using it internally so with some of these GPSs. They have their own web UIs that allow you to do it through them, and you don't need a high pack driver. You're just getting a correction from the GPS itself. But either way, you need to know all that information. If you're going to use a VRS network, you need to arrange for a third party subscription, a correction stream. And, you know, that's not on us. You need to know that information. You need to pay for that. You have to get the subscription. And we will help you for sure. We will help you find uh, the proper service. We don't sell them. But if you were to uh, ask us about a service for streaming, we could help you get there. Alternately, a lot of the departments of transportation in, in various states are now using these. I know North Carolina DOT has a great one, Florida has one, uh, Connecticut has one, just a few that I've worked in recently that I've seen. Um, the VRS is actually, although you have to set up an ID and a password and you have to have your own account, it's actually free. So uh, that's a great way to get a free service and um, your localized water surface elevation coming right through your GPS. You'll still have to pay for the internet um, and uh, arrange for that. The other way is uh, old fashioned on the right side, not old fashioned at all really, but just around longer, use of the base station over a ground control point. You set it up locally within the GPS and then you transmit knowing where you are exactly, it will be able to take the initial differential GPS position coming from the onboard GPS. It'll communicate to the base station. It will say, okay, well based on all that information we have, we're gonna throw back a correction at you and further correct your position to make it more accurate and your elevation. And so that gets more localized. So those are the two main ways to do it if you're using RTK, either the base station, more money up front, or VRS where you can sort of piecemeal it. You just need internet. You also need the RTK upgrade in the GPS itself. You need to make sure the GPS is RTK upgradable. Where do RTK measurements come from? Well, you know, the RTK uh, measurements are shown here 
you write, uh, you see a lot of N's and K's, et cetera. Uh, N and K are basically referencing your geoid model and uh, the, the differential between ellipsoid and geoid. So uh, you might find that you uh, need to talk to high pack tech support when you're setting up your RTK dredge and you shouldn't feel bad about it. And if you need any help, just look at this page and it'll either make sense to you or tell you that you should be calling high pack for a little more assistance. Again, the NTRIP corrections, this is the NTRIP driver within HiPAC. Again, you need to know the correction stream. You gotta get your VRS subscription, your third party, do it via DOT or a paid service, either way. Um, we don't have that information for you. We can't help you with a username and a password, but we can help you set this up. If you have all that information, we can help you set it up. If you've already tried and it's not working for you, give us a call, we'll help you set it up in HiPAC. Okay, cutter suction, high pack device drivers. So what we are looking at here is uh, position, heading, and tie. That's coming in on your GPS. Um, GPS DLL is the main driver that we use for that. For your cutter tool, we have a variety. You're gonna put the inclinometer DLL. That's for your depth sensor, whether you're using an angle sensor or you're using the, uh, the pressure sensor, either way. HD25A, rotation sensor. Um, that's also placed on the ladder mobile, um, so uh, that would go on the second mobile down from the boat, which has the initial GPS position and heading. A swing indicator and cut fill, they are not drivers that are specifically bringing in any piece of hardware information. They're using the information that comes in, and they're allowing us, oops, they're allowing us the ability to give us various pieces of information. Swing indicator DLL, we'll talk a little bit more about that. It allows the operator to have a, an acceptable range uh, with which he can work or within which he can work. And it's basically usually set up to provide the most efficient range for an operator uh, to go about things. Cut fill, uh, as shown here on the right where it's maroon, green, and blue. And uh, the black line is gonna read template information. And it is going to show you where you are relative to your template based on where your cutter is. And the spud, gen offset driver, that's going to help you get your spud location uh, horizontally referenced from your Tronian XY. GPS DLL, some pictures of the hardware program. At first, you have to load in the GPS NMEA0183 driver. That gets loaded in no matter what. If you're connecting over serial, you're connecting over network, same driver. You need position, absolutely need position. You absolutely need, you absolutely need heading. And um, that, that's no matter what. Even if you have a swinging ladder, put heading under the GPS, um, you'll need to have that as a function. You'll also then on the, the ladder mobile, then use heading um, exclusively just for the HD25A. And at the bottom, you see the offsets tab we talked about. Starboard, forward, and vertical offsets all um, for the GPS. The inclinometer DLL shown right here. This is within the setup, the drop down option I mentioned before. E track RVG inclinometer used 90% of the time. You need to enter your ladder length. The radius is optional. It's a little bit of a mis, uh, misnomer because, quite honestly, it's really put in there so that you can add this value. If, for instance, you can't bring your calibration point to the surface, like the bottom of your cutter head doesn't come up to the surface, well, in that case, what we can do is uh, we can say how far from the surface is the bottom of your cutter head or your calibration point. Oh, it, you're two feet below the water. Well, let's enter a two foot radius and there we can calibrate. So we would actually bring like the center of the cutter head up. That becomes um, the relative calibration position. But then we add the two feet that we know about beneath that to get us to the true depth uh, that we need to get to. So most of the time, a radius is not entered. So, you know, buyer beware on that one. Uh, and then the test window, once you calibrate, you see it up at the top, 20 feet, uh, 20.06 feet, and it gives you the ladder X at the bottom. So that's our inclinometer test window. Talked about the HD25A. There is the sensor that's usually placed uh, over the shaft so that you can put it directly on the rotation point of your ladder. And you can see some of the contraptions necessary to bring it into your computer. But ultimately, it will come in over the serial connection or a USB. Calibration will be done at high pack hardware. And just like with the other devices, here is this SEI Explorer program uh, that will be um, used within the pre high pack calibration of your HD for 25A 
of your e-track inclinometer. A couple different devices use the same program. Here's the swing indicator. You can see at right, you set up the ranges. You put the cup width in. It's a predefined angle set of lines so that you can have your operator work off of them and he knows how far he is uh, off of the either another mobile or a manu manually uh, set uh, position or bag, they call it. And then also you could have a planned line that's referenced here also. So the idea is that you're going to, um, you're going to express your feet or express your speed in feet per second or minute, and then it gives the operator an idea how fast the cutter is moving as he goes through the material. So it's just a way to compute the speed and also the uh, the angular offsets from where you should be, keep you in an efficient range. Cut fill indicator, we go here where it says dredge pack chart, you go to channel, you load in your channel, it could be a CHN, it could be uh, a matrix file, MTX, either way you put it in, that serves as your dredge template. Then you could come in here and right click in here to set up the, uh, the user interface. You could change these colors, you could change the cut tolerances, etc. And then it's going to feed this cut fill in the dredge pack window. It lets you know where your cutter head is uh, based on its location and its depth, how far you have to go down to your, uh, down to your template. The Vulcan D DLL is very useful. It's another device driver, it doesn't directly connect just to one device and bring it into high pack. It uses it once it's in. Uh, Vulcan DLL, um, it is a way for you to assign more matrix cells to your cutter head or your auger head. If you have an auger head, it's like you have one of those old fashioned looking um, lawn mowers, right? In the front, that churn, you know, the cylindrical type. If you have that type of auger dredge situation, you might have a two foot by eight or nine or 10 foot wide auger, and you want to not just have one matrix cell updated, which will be the default of the inclinometer driver to give you one depth and then in, uh, right at the center of your calibration point, we, we um, give you that X, Y, Z, and we will fill one matrix cell. Well, you probably want one more than that. Here's where you set up your bucket width, your bucket height in hardware, and it allows for user-defined dimensions for your matrix update. Mostly it's used with auger dredges and if your cutter head is larger than the size of your dredge matrix uh, cell size. And you want to keep the matrix cell size down for good reason because you want to have great resolution. But at the same time, um, you, you don't want to have it too small because then you'll run uh, the risk of having really large file sizes and windows. Gen offset is the driver shown here at the top. Here's a, a, a basic uh, hierarchy or a bulleted outline if you will, high pack config, you'll have your boat, oops, you'll have your mobile, you'll have your spud shown last. And basically what the idea here is, you would get your spud location, you put in X, Y offsets from your trunnion center point. And that way uh, you can take that information, it could be reported out, it's always in your raw files. Every mobile is being saved. Every time that you're out there, we know where your spuds are, whether you're trying to avoid contaminated areas, you're trying to stay out of certain areas, you're trying to avoid a pipeline, well, this is what you need for your spuds to make sure that you're not spudding down where you shouldn't be. DQM cutter suction, the dredge quality management cutter suction standard as mandated by uh, or overseen by the Army Corps is probably the way I should say it. Um, they've developed it, we've helped them write the code, and we obviously are well equipped to deal with the DQM standard as we've written so much of this programming. And so we can output real time any of your DQM data. Right now, if you're a 20 inch uh, pipe or larger, you are already doing this. There's been talk for years about mandating that the smaller ones also use the DQM standard to send out real time information to the Army Corps. You could see the types of data here. Uh, it shows you the pipe diameter, yep, 20 inch, therefore that's a mandatory one. Um, and, and you see density and all these other things. Um, all sorts of information these days, you know, um, more and more we're seeing people request uh, non-nuclear density meters and other things, uh, red meters and, and others out there are providing quality non-nuclear uh, density meters and uh, you can collect that data in high pack and many others, uh, other pieces of data, this stuff can go out. Uh, to DQM standard. Anyway, the idea is that uh, we meet the DQM standard. If it's a concern of yours, please 
call us. Um, it might require a little bit of custom programming, but chances are it'll just mean that we have to come out to the job site. And I believe we're at the last slide. Dredge Pack Playback is the way you take your raw files, bring them into the high pack shell, and see how your dredge progress went during the day. As soon as you're done with your raw files, you can go back into the high pack shell and do this. And you go under view and select the playback option. You have to load in the, the raw file and um, you have a chance to uh, show the play speed so you don't have to sit through the day at real time. It's not that slow. Um, but anyway, the idea is that you are going to be able to see where you were. We talked about those spud locations. Well, you'll see where they are too if you use gen offset to give you your spud locations. So it's a great way of being able to play back all of your data when it's all done. All right, let's take a quick look now if we can. I have a very short video that I'd like to show. It, it really gives us so many different options within dredge pack. So let's take a look at this. And the idea here is that we're looking at a cutter suction from a DXF. And we're swinging in dredge pack, we're going left and right. You can see that over the map view, zooming in and zooming out easily with the uh, cursor on the, um, the magnifying glass, plus and minus. You can zoom in, zoom out. You can see there's a turned on uh, plant line file with the arrows on it. He's going, uh, let's see, logging. We can choose all of our logging options, chart channel under here. This is where you can drop in a channel file for template purposes or a center line if you want to have a, a, a left right indicator. Uh, the boat, the cutter head, which is your main vessel? You have to specify that on your cutter head. It should be the main vessel is your second mobile where your ladder is. In this case, we're choosing to take all the device offsets and apply them so that we now see red dots, your GPS location and all of these. The matrix outdate options, you can record maximum depth, minimum depth, most recent depth, et cetera. You could set your tide manually. So these are many of the options, navigation parameters, where we can go through and set up logging backup times, matrix backup times for you to back up your data. You can choose to go in the min window manager and work and see which windows you have out there and assign them to various monitors. Um, what else? Oh, matrix display options. We have dredge depth, survey depth. There's a bunch of different options you get to choose and whichever one you choose, it will apply that relative to the color scale set up at top left. Now, if you just click anywhere within the matrix, it's showing your channel depth, it's showing your matrix depth. This is the data display configuration routine. Just go to the top right data display, click on configure. You go through, you click on whatever you want, whichever mobile, and you could add that piece of information over to the right side. And now we see final depth, status logging. You see that we're RTK, et cetera. So the idea is that when we do this, uh, we have the ability to look at any type of data, visualize any data, and it's really, um, it's, it's just a, a nice and easy way for us to be able to um, get through um, a dredge pack installation and apply everything that we learned earlier on for us to be able to um, to use that instrumentation the right way and show it up on the dredge pack screen. That's what it's all about. It has to look good in the end in dredge pack. It has to be accurately um, monitored and everything has to be calibrated. Um, so. Anyway, uh, right now, I think we're going to open it up to um, a question and answer period because we have some time left uh, to get some uh, questions. And uh, let's see. Okay. Hi, everyone. Well, thank you for that presentation. And before we start the Q&A section, um, we just want to thank everyone for coming. Um, we hope you stick around for this, but if not, um, your questions will be answered via email in the next week. Um, just a reminder before we start the Q&A, um, our HIPAC 2021 virtual training event, registration is now open, which is so exciting. And you can find the link on our homepage of our website. Um, and it also in our Sounding Better newsletter. Um, okay, so we're going to start the Q&A session. All righty. <laughs> Thank you so much, Brittany. I'm sorry for moving all around, but uh, we did have one of these questions that came through, and I, I wanted to show you here how to get somewhere, and I'm sorry for taking you on that little wild ride. Uh, but anyway, in Windows Explorer, if you go to any high-pack uh, folder, here we are, high-pack 2020, 
I went in and I'm specifically looking for SEI Explorer um, because that's the configuration program for so many of these e-track sensors that have US digital integrated sensors within them. So if you go to any HiPAC install, HiPAC 2020, you go into the support folder and then you go to utilities, you'll see a couple different things. Pocket Max, this is the configuration for uh, another program, that's for Hemisphere, we'll get there next. Come down here, SEI Explorer, I think I'll have to run this as administrator. But the idea is that if you run this program it will open up the proprietary software that you need to connect to that sensor it's running all of the device drivers that are necessary right now if you have a cutter suction dredge you are going to have to use this almost uh, almost 100 percent of the time you're going to have to go through this process that we're going through right now uh, it is very important and if your device drivers aren't run properly we're not going to be able uh, to, to talk to your sensor uh, we need these device drivers to run right off the bat. So here we go. It says finish. Okay, great. Now it's going to open up, and I'm going to do everything I can to avoid showing you my messy desktop. SEI Explorer. Now here it opens up. Oh, it says we haven't found any devices. I'm not connected to anything, okay? So what do I want to do? I just want to play the demo. Click no, play the SEI demo. Okay, no. Here it goes, it shows the address number of devices. These are 360 degree sensors, so they can come in. We can do different things within it. We can assign address numbers. We could read the raw values. And we could also, if this weren't a demo, click in this resolution bar and assign the real world angle that you'd like that to be. Um, so that's actually 360.0 degrees that we're looking at, 3600 for your resolution. So that was the first question. Okay, that was, that was a, a very good one. I'm glad somebody brought that up. Um, that, that's certainly important. I think I'm done messing with your eyes. Okay, so let's see. Um, is the RTK sensor recommended for inland water bodies that have fluctuating water levels? Y yes and no. Um, you know, we don't want to tell you that you have to use RTK, um, but if you have to use it, uh, it is certainly recommended if you need to have a very tight tolerance and they're talking about you know before you put it out on water and deal with other error budgets rtk you could have like a, a two tenths uh, of a foot type of accuracy they, they advertise it on land as uh you know two centimeters vertically for fixed rtk so if you're at two centimeters you're less than an inch away uh, now obviously other instrumentation adds to your error budget um the ladder etc but if you can take that and reduce that position down to the center of your trunnion we've reduced out so many errors we've gotten rid of errors and now it's just a matter of our angle sensor getting us to the proper position and depth of that cutter head so but inland water bodies with fluctuating water levels i would say um you might want to look into rtk you might want to look into a tide gauge and if if it only changes like once a day or every other week or something set that in dredge pack go to the tide drop down in, in dredge pack and go set tide and set your positive tide as a negative value for a correction in high pack it'll be much easier um let's see what else can we see all right can you speak to updating multi-beam matrix for dredgers that are running systems simultaneously oh okay all right so yes we do have some options within dredge pack i don't have any uh, videos or, or pictures to illustrate it perhaps just yet, but uh, yes, you can run the simultaneous uh, multi-beam uh, and also in in dredge pack, show your dredge matrix. So that would be your simultaneously able to scan uh, perhaps for infill or any other thing that might be in your water column and then also providing the dredge depth. So it's something that we work with um, there's a variety of single beam and multi beam sensors, but uh, a lot of times in these sand uh, pits, what we'll have is like a, a two or three single beam sensors out there at various points to allow for um, QC checks for your infill, how much sand is falling in uh, after. Uh, let's see, what else do we have? Uh, interested in dredge up, dredge down for volumes. Oh, gosh. Wow, that is, uh, and once we get into volumes work, that's uh, an entirely different thing. I'd like to refer you to our YouTube videos, uh, which will be, okay, yep, look here. Um, there's a way uh, to go there. But just if you go to YouTube, I think you're looking for uh, high pack support videos or high pack video on YouTube. Either way, 
um, there's so many more uh, YouTube videos already there talking about um, uh, dredge volume and up and down, et cetera. Uh, and that would be a much longer uh, discussion there.